Okay, so, welcome. <laughs> welcome to um, the final um, uh, lecture, so week 12. Oh, we've done R. Oh. The final lecture, of, uh, the final lecture of the course. Uh, so week 12. I'm not abandoning you next week, week 13. I will be here, but using the time for consult. So I'll be in this room. If you want to come in individually and grab me for a bit of time, or come as a large group and we discuss problems you're having with the writing or whatever. I mean, last time I think we used time and tutorials for that, and it proved to be very um, useful, I think, for some people. So please try and use that time if you can. But we're not required to be here next in the lecture next week. You are required to keep coming to the tutorials, however, in order to finish off your hypertext. Is that going okay? Are you finding it? Oh dear. <laughs> Have a few. Yeah. Is it a bit challenging, or? It is challenging. Is it the doing it that's challenging, or the ideas that are challenging? Okay, well what I'm going to do today, hopefully we'll clear things up a bit. I've got a little new blue sheet. So you need to grab one of these on the way out. But I'm going to go through this blue sheet. What I uh, realised when I was in the market last time was that most of you hadn't read the blue sheet. Um, and weren't familiar with what's being asked of you here. Alright, so we must, must make sure. How many people have looked at this and used it as their writing as a way of... Interesting enough of, yeah, okay, that's good. You really need to get your head around this. And there's also a printing error, let me tell you about. So go through that. And I've also found um, an interview with John Marsden on the Q&A show, which I'm beginning to really love, actually. Uh, and uh, it's a 10-minute thing about who the invaders are. I don't know if anyone's seen that on YouTube. It's really good. Uh, so he, he answers a question from the audience about who the invaders are. Oh, and goes through. And it's really interesting how he thinks about ideology and his novel. So, is, is that revealed in the late books? Yeah. <coughs> not, no, I don't think so. Are they? Yeah. I've not read. Although in the um, in the interview you'll see there are people who've got theories around that. So we'll we'll look at that. But it's a ten minute piece of film, so I want to make sure we have enough time for it. So I'm just going to whiz through this. All right. So as you will know by now, everyone, as you will know by now, assignment three is, is about using a world context-centred um, structure to think about how readers are positioned within the text and about how you might resist that. And the assignment requires you, it's in two parts, and it requires you to, to develop a hypertext, which, or a hypertext document, which um, charts three transformations of a text. Now, one of the questions that keeps coming up is, can I do the same, can I choose the same bit of text and do three different bits to it? Um, no, the answer to that. Um, can, I, can I do the same, can I do a transformation on, two transformations on one piece of text? You can, okay, that's within the rules of the assignment, but I don't know why you would. Okay, so my take on that question is, which has come up a lot, um, is that for two, th for two reasons. One is, you have three opportunities here to dazzle me with your ability to transform a text, so why would you only choose two? You know, it's kind of like, it's knocking down your chances of extra points, yeah? Um, but also, very often, when you're transforming a text twice, the same piece of text twice, you really are perhaps doing a with reading and then an inversion, yeah? That there's more chances of you falling into that trap. So you do need three different pieces of text unless you've negotiated with me otherwise. But I think there's one case where actually it does work. I can see why they're doing it. But apart from that, I would uh, stick to three. Plus also you're writing a defence of 2,000 words. So we'll look in a minute um, about that. Um, I also do need, don't forget, I do need you to staple your last assignment, the copy of your last assignment for this assignment. Okay, because for people who are on the borderline between satisfactory or high or some kind of borderline, if I can look back and see if there's been improvements made from the last assignment, that will inform us as to what mark to give you. So it's completely in your interest to put a copy of the assignment attached to the old one, the new one. The key here 
The key to this assignment is to understand the ideologies. Okay, you can make, you can have the most fantastic hypertext document, the most imaginative. You can make a whole, you could make a whole movie. I think I discussed with someone today about making a movie. You could do that, but if you don't understand why you're doing it, the person who just crossed out one word and transformed the entire paragraph is going to get a much better mark than you who put all the effort into making a movie. Okay. Because the whole point of this is to think about why, how and why you're transforming the text and what ideologies you're disrupting. What are you troubling? What are you troubling within the text? So these are the questions I came up with last week, which hopefully, I've had, I've had enough requests for this from you to make me think that you're using it slightly. But these are really good. Uh, the way I would use these is as a, set, as a set of notes next to you as you're doing your your um, transformations within um, the tutes. I'd have this next to you. And these are the questions I'm really wanting answered in the assignment. So how did you read the base text? So what position did you think you were in? What ideology do you think was being evoked? Uh, what particular reading practices did I employ to produce these readings? And we've done enough reader response theory for you, for you to be able to answer that question with full sophistication. What values, beliefs, discourses or ideologies do I recognise in the base text? What do I see in there? How do I try and reposition the reader of my transformation to accept different ones? What did I do to reposition the implied reader? And what changes did I make and why? So the why is the key to that. Yeah? Um, is this in first person? Good question. I've looked back over the essays, um, a few of them, I was Matthew I think, um, I, I looked back over a few of the essays from last year. Some of them are in first person, and some of them are in um, uh, third person. I personally would stick to th third person if you can, because I think that helps you, that help, will help some of you develop your academic voice. I think that's a better way of you developing your writing that way. So for some of you who had specific comments um, back about your writing skills, your uh, vocabulary, or your expression or sentence structure, it's going to be a lot easier for you to stick in the third person. You'll get a better result for yourself, you know. Uh, but I think it's also possible to write this in the first person because it is your defence, you know. So I think go with what um, go with what you want to do. I think you have. It seems to you have a choice there. If I find out any different to that, I'll, you'll know by the end of this week. But I think that's 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 what I'm that's what I'm taking from it. Okay. So what we're going to do is have a really good look at this piece of paper. Right, so I've scanned this piece of paper, and this is the top bit, because you have two sets of criteria on any mark within this, um, this, this, this course, and also any English course you do. Now, I've had a couple of comments. People are doing history, computer studies, other things, sports science, um, and people are saying, well, I got a really good mark. No one marked me down for my spelling in sports science. No one marked me down for my spelling in, spelling in computer studies. Talked about that today. Um, and that's because if you look at the criteria, they're not actually marking you for that. If you look at the criteria for those essays, there isn't a criteria like this, which is called the control of textual features. But they're not marking you for your spelling. There's going to be a general kind of, you know, if you start to spell there, T-H-E-I-R, but it should be the other way around. Some people will pick that up just as an inaccuracy, and it will affect your mark, because they, it will affect the clarity, the understanding of your point. Um, but generally they're not marking for that. We are because this is an English course and you're going to become English teachers. So we need to make sure that you have the basic knowledge of this. All right? So that's why this is a bit different. And that's why um, when a lot of you came to me after your last assignment was handed back with this awful kind of, you know, you've just, you just talked about the things I don't want to talk about ever. The fact that I don't really know how to use a comma. I have no idea what a semicolon is because no one taught me. You know? And we, I know all that. I know all that hard ideas around shame. I feel that myself. We all do, right? We just have to get over it. <laughs> you really do. You have to get used to your writing being critiqued, and get, kind of get over it, right? And move on. Take the criticism. Take the bash. Go on, you know. And don't get don't get too down about it. But this is how. What I want you to know is this is how we're marking you, all right? So there's three categories here. There's uh, limited, or I'm sorry, there's unsatisfactory. There's satisfactory, and there's outstanding or extra high. Now to receive an extra high all over, so to receive an extra high as a final mark, you have to have extra high in this and in 
your um, other criteria. So even if you've got an extra high in the content, if you've only got a satisfactory in, in this criteria, you'll never get an extra high. So an extra high is when both, when the planets align, okay? both things come together, which is very rare, I have to say, in any way. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of chance rather than anything else. So unsatisfactory is characterized by major and or frequent minor inaccuracies. And that's around capitalization, um, bad sentence structure, kind of ridiculous punctuation where you're starting to get double um, full stops at the end. Yeah. Just a quick question with the unsatisfactory. What does limited mean? Well, limited means when we're, and I find this hard to get. In fact, Soren and I frequently have arguments about this. Where I go, this person was just trying something out, given we're interested. No, it's wrong. <laughs> so that's the point. So really, uh, the truth of the matter is, limited is when Sora and I argue. <laughs> but truthfully, limited is where it's not, it's not, um, it's not so frequent that. So say, for instance, a spelling mistake has been made once, but the other, there, there have been the same word correctly spelled later. It's seen as perhaps a proofing thing, or you know, as opposed to kind of a real problem with this person's ability to use English. Yeah. So that would be the difference between limited and unsatisfactory. Um, limited, I also um, limited um, also means that uh, we can. If you get unsatisfactory in the top one, then whatever mark you get in the bottom one, it will remain unsatisfactory. Okay, because this this moderates any unsatisfactory moderates the rest of the marks. If you get satisfactory and above, that doesn't moderate the rest of the marks. But unsatisfactory does. Okay, so do you, someone, there, there have been people here who've got um, satisfactory plus or even high minus or very high even. I think there's one person that had a limited or unsatisfactory um, in this particular criteria, which meant that their overall mark was. Because yeah, your content could be great. You know, your ideas and your intellect are fantastic. But your expression um, is letting you down. And probably you, like me, spent my entire university life with those comments. You know, great ideas, expression that you know. I thought if I read that one more time, I'm going to strangle a person you want. <laughs> no, okay, well tell me how to make it better. Then. <laughs> right, so you're not alone. This is what we all go through. This is the first assignment you just did of the first year, a four-year course, and just doing one course. So you have to put it in perspective. Um, but I want you to know what this means. So satisfactory is minor and infrequent inaccuracies. So that's when someone hasn't edited, or someone's fairly good actually, or proves a little bit, or done a spell check and gone through. Um, but in fact, um, there's still some spelling mistakes there. So what we do there is mark them, and um, but you still get a, that's a satisfactory. It's about you paying more attention to detail. But also, if you look, all of these, um, all of these. Uh, this particular criteria is judged to over four, four areas. So there's structure and clarity, style, paragraph, and sentences, and how the structure works out. And I have to say, I was very, very impressed generally with how you guys picked up the idea of the structure I showed you and the paragraphs and thinking paragraphs and you know, point one, point two. So you did very well with structure. I'm really pleased about that. Uh, so generally, you guys did very well with all that, apart from some people who had lonely paragraphs. And that's usually where you, I think I said before, you've been writing a paragraph and then you can't bear to delete it. You kind of leave it in, hoping it will kind of get some kind of credit. You know? But in fact, it just didn't belong there. You know? So that's where you start to pick up problems with paragraphs. I think, well, what's that doing there? They're not following any kind of stru any structure there. Presentation, vocabulary, and terminology, that you're using the terminology correctly. Most of you did. That was fine, pretty much. Um, Format, references, in-text lists, dependencies, quotations, and typos. So the convener of the course will check that before it comes to me, in fact. And that's where, so that's where the red pen, Sorrel, um, checks the first page of the reference list of every, every because she holds um, the standard around that with the course. And finally, explaining grammar and punctuation. So that's the things we're looking at in this particular um, criteria. So is that all right? Is that clear? Are you clear about what we're looking for now? Um, get to know the back of this piece of paper. It is your friend, you know, and you can go through. Plus, also, if you've got a proofer, which all of you should have a proofer, someone who proofs your work, and not someone who likes you very much, Matthew. Matthew's got a proofer who's in all of him, so it means, oh, it's like, it's my <laughs> that's not necessarily what we want. We want someone who's kind but can be critical. Right? Hello. 
But get to know this blue sheet and mark yourself. Plus also give this to your proofer. Say, can you look for this? This is exactly what I'm looking for in you. I'm not looking to see if you understand the ideas or criticise my use of Foucault. Well, actually, that's my use of Foucault. Um, but what I am wanting to do is to look at this bit here. Can you mark me on this? Yeah. How do you work around proving work with someone else, but then not showing an also work as a plagiarism? Yeah, tough one. Either someone you really trust, really, really trust, um, or um, someone outside of the course. Someone not in the, and you should know someone who's not in this course who can prove, especially with the, it's slightly different in, the, in my era, which is, you know, horses and the male coach or whatever. But when you've got um, email and what have you, it's much easier just to whiz this off to someone and say, can you just spend 20 minutes looking at it? And look after your proof first, send them a nice card saying thank you at the end of the academic year, chocolates. But they do a lot of work for you, and if you do that, then they're going to become a real advocate for, your, for you and your education. And they can, you know, they, can, they can get you that extra mark you need to get what you want, you know? so be nice to them. All right, so that's criteria of one. So are we okay about any further questions? I'm happy to stay here as long as we need to to talk about this. Okay, brilliant. One, actually, one last thing. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff you want your proof of for, we can't see. You literally cannot see. As you're reading an assignment, your head's in a, thinking of big ideas, the structure, the paragraphs. You absolutely cannot see if that commas, you know, because your mind, your eyes have been told not to look at that and look at something else. So it, it, there's two ways around that. One, get your proofer to do it. When it comes back, you'll go, oh, I see. God, I should have seen that, shouldn't I? We all do that. Um, or give it enough time. So if you have a week in between writing it and um, reading it again, then you possibly will be able to pick that stuff up. But whilst you're actually doing it in your head, you're still saying it as it's been written, you can't see it. So don't beat yourself up about that. That's just something that psychologically is impossible to do. <coughs> okay. So the rather more interesting criteria two. Okay, so this is this bit. Now, so far, criteria one has got one section, basically. It's got four different... So I'll go back, sorry. It's got three or four um, different sections in it, but it's actually one section. So that's, that's a sort of... That's one quarter, if you like. Um, criteria two has got three sections. And I just wanted to point out something, that this section here really is the major section that's looking at hypermedia. So it says, can, I, can you read that? Is it big enough? Yes. Good. So it's talking about, um, I'll, I'll use the high one, an effective application of the concept of repositioning the reader through the control of the hypermedia. So that's the section I'll be looking at when it comes to um, looking at your hypertext. So I just want you to be aware of that. I want you to be aware that we're talking, the hypertext is a quarter of your overall mark. All right? Because some of you might find it more, use, more comfortable to be making the hypertext looking fantastic and getting moving pictures and sounds and all manner of wonderful things. But just be aware, there's only so many marks I can give you for that. You know? So if you have to spend your time thinking about, because you've got three other assignments to do, I know you're busy people, so where are you going to put your time? You know? the, hy the hypertext can be adequate, can be great, you know? but don't spend hours and hours and hours on that, making it perfect, because you can have a great hypertext, but you could still lose it in the, in the, the writing. All right? So just balance that one out strategically. OK, so I'm going to go down the high section. OK, we can see what we've got there. So the first thing I'm looking at is um, knowledge and understanding of reading practices. So this is a well-developed understanding of key concepts involved in making theoretical, sh so making theoretical shifts from the base text to transform the text. So what do you think the key um, concepts involved in that are? What are the key concepts in changing from a base text to a transformed text? Um, reading with across and against. Yeah. That's one set of ideas, yeah. Identifying like, the ideologies on the shift and the like your shift in the original base text as well. Tick VG. Absolutely. Spot on. Yes. So you have to know that the ideology thought I've been banging on to you about for the last five weeks ideologies and discourses. And that's why we bang on to you about it. So you have to be able to express those. So you can do the best transformation in the world. I said to someone, I, kept, so I keep saying to people, you know, you can easily put flying monkeys in your hypertext, but why are they there? You know? You could do amazing things with your transformations. 
in terms of the hypertext. But if you can't justify it, what are you doing? Yeah? So you have to be able to offer me a well-developed understanding of key concepts involved in making theoretical shifts from base text to transform text. And that in bracket says defense because it belongs in the defense. Okay. The next one is a strong awareness of why particular textual and IT features have been used. So this is also a little bit of hypertext in here as well. Since, since the transformation actually occurs in the hypertext, yeah, that's where I'm going to see the transformation occur. Uh, this also is slightly included in that as well. So a strong awareness of why particular textual IT features have been used. So this is the why did you do it. So why did you change the word terror to the word cotton? Or you know, what was it doing? What did it do to the text? Why did you? There's a classic one at the moment where a lot of people are looking at um, the tree house and how that. You know, and there's two words in there which is so it goes from tea parties and dolls straight over to prisoners and spying. So there's the word spying. So why might you change any of those words to do something? You know, what's it doing to the text? And why have you changed it? All right, so that's the knowledge and understanding of reading practices. So that's one criteria. The next one is the uh, hypermedia. Now I need to let you know here. Can you see? Can you see this? Yeah, that is a printing error. We get these printed out, and um, both Sora and I proofed it. Well, I kind of went, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, so that's wrong. Alright? But it's okay. Is that wrong? Why did I think that was wrong? <laughs> oh yeah, because it's above. Do you see it's 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 a duplicate of what's above? Yeah. So what it should be is a considerable awareness of the concept of repositioning the reader through the control of hypermedia instead of what it is. So when I mark it, I'll mark it like that. Just so you know I'm aware there's a problem with the mark sheet and we kind of can collectively resolve it just by knowing it's wrong. All right. Okay, so the next one is the hypermedia. So, uh, in terms of the high, we're looking for an effective application. If you start to look at some of these words, actually, with this, it's quite interesting. I mean, the, the extra high in this, I have to say, this particular um, expression of extra high, I just don't know how anyone would do that, really. That's a really high level. You know, it's a really tough one to get. And it's there for a reason. It's, been, it's not. We haven't made this up. It's been checked by a number of boards, and it's been going for 15 years. So, you know, it's all right. It's not like you know we're, we're leading you up the garden path or anything. But at the same time, I think it's a tough one to get. So to actually get into the, in, an independent and original, independent, independent judgment and original thought in a highly effective application of uh, the concept of repositioning, I think is quite tough to get to grasp that one. So if you do an amazing hypertext and only get VH, it's because that's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one to get. But can you start to see the language used here? Highly, oh God, oh sorry, that's me not here. Highly effective application, um, or an effective application, or considerable awareness, or application of the concept of repositioning. So we have the fact. So here we have the fact that we know the concept. Yeah, so people can go. There is not. So that would be. There is an ideology in the novel which looks at childhood, therefore I'm doing this. Yeah? So I can see that you know the word ideology, you know, and you know it's about childhood, but you've done nothing more to kind of elaborate on that. You've done the transformation, but you've not, you've not kind of gone into the idea of what childhood is and what it might mean. The next one will be considerable awareness. Um, yeah. Limited effectiveness and ineffective applications. This is kind of where it's going wrong as well. Yeah. If someone puts something in about um, uh, being about peace, so instead of war, there's peace, which is another kind of thing that's going on. Um, and they put in uh, talking about bombing. So it's just kind of like it's just confusing. It's not really following through. You know. uh, so this one be considerable awareness. This one an effective application. So. Uh, a high standard is if you have done it effectively. So that's quite good. So most of you should be able to, I've seen a lot of what you're doing, it's brilliant. So most of you should be able to get that in terms of your hypertext. The next one is a highly effective. That's why you're reaching new heights. But there's nothing about that that can be critiqued. 
the following one will be the idea of the original, which I think is quite difficult to get. Okay, and the final, okay, so the, we've got one criteria about knowledge of theory, okay, knowledge of reading practices in the theory, then there's the hypertext, and the following one is about the use of literature. Firstly, the novel, and secondly, research literature. So again, look at some of the words in there. A highly effective use and integration for extra high. Effective use and integration, effective use, so you can use it. Um, appropriate use, so someone who says something like... Uh, Gender is a construction, Butler, 1991. You know, so I know they know Butler, so I know it's appropriate. And Butler talks about gender construction, so that's great. But I don't know anything more. I can't assess whether you've kind of grasped it. I just kind of know that you know where to point. You know, you're there. I don't know if you're able to express it or articulate Sorry, it. Sorry, you said the novel there. Like, do you mean the novel used in chapter 9 or your base text? Chapter 9, in chapter the base nine? text, yeah. Like the basics you were choosing for the interventions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really, um, yeah, it's about you. I mean, to be honest, in this particular assignment, you can't not do it because I'm asking you to look at specific time. This is why we're doing it. We're doing a very close reading of various pieces. And for some of you, it's the first time you've done a close reading of literature. But no, a couple of you, I've been in cheats and I've been looking through a sentence, and I said, but why is the word terror there? Doesn't that disrupt the sentence? Or, you know, if you start to do a close reading of everything, or bits of that, that or any kind of literature, you can see that um, you can find themes that aren't necessarily there in just a kind of casual reading, obedient reading, if you're reading critically, closely. And with this particular assignment, you can't help but do that, because you're doing your small chunks. Yeah? But it's good training for later on, because very often I've been working, is there any second years here? There's one I know came in with me. Picnic at Hanging Rock. Um, and I had a few students, we were doing Picnic at Hanging Rock, fantastic book, and a few students said there are gender issues in Picnic at Hanging Rock. I could tell you that about reading the book. I know enough about, you know, you could, I could work out enough about Picnic and Hanging Rock to say there were gender issues in the book without reading the book. You know? So this is about. In terms of the novel, this is about you actually <coughs> penetrating the text and saying, I know there are gender issues, and this is where they, this is a good example of them here. Look, look, you know, and being precise as to how you're looking. And how you're looking. Are you looking at themes, characters? Or how are you actually using the text? Now, with this particular assignment, you can't help but do that because of the nature of what you're doing. Right? So, in a sense, you're going to be, a, thank you, Joel, you're going to be okay. But in terms of the research literature, this is where I think it could fall down. Um, for each of the ideologies that you're identifying, so if you're identifying ideology around war or gender or um, uh, childhood, uh, you, sorry, discourses, you have to find some related literature. That could be in what we've given you already. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff we've given you already in the reader. Or it could be outside the reader. Um, but I need to see that you're using research literature appropriately. And here you have, you know, this is, I mean, to be honest, this is where people, I always, I always think of um, Google, I, I, in my head I call them Google students. You know, students who actually don't want to stand up from the, and I'm like that, sometimes I'm sat at the desk, I think I actually can't be bothered to go over there and get that piece of paper that'll tell me the information, I'll try to look at You know? And this, and what comes from that is poor. Poor, poor use of um, research literature to support. And also kind of overuse of things like handbooks. This is when someone's making a point around philosophy, for instance, and that comes from the handbook of philosophy. Like, well, where's the primary text? No, where's the primary source? And the things we're looking for to kind of up the ante are primary sources. So if you're talking about Freud, quote Freud. Even as a quote we've got from another text, find the text and quote Freud, primary text. Or if you're using, um, sorry, and also um, recent, well, you know, recent texts. Those are the two things that kind of get you, could change by those points. When we're looking, so when I'm looking at your, um, at your, bio, um, so your reference, your reference list at the back, if all I can see is, you know, beach, beach, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, another website, another website, a handbook. Handbook companion to philosophy. You think, well, what research did they really do? You know, 
they did research that I gave them. We gave them the we gave them the reader, and they did research which was actually a um, a uh, a search on Google. So you use a search engine to do that, um, and you looked it up in a few dictionaries. Yeah, and that would I mean that's effective. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's a good start. It's a good place to start. We could is fantastic as a kind of map to show you where to go. As long as you go there, you know. So effect, that's effective, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just effective. If you want to start getting these highly effective user and integrations, not only you're getting the information, you're integrating it right into the text. So that's how you start to get better marketing with these two. And all it takes, and people say, oh, I haven't got time, that's generally what people think anyway. But what am I meant to be doing back then? You know? When I'm asleep? Okay. We get all shirty. Um, it really just it does just take um, a bit of work at home, perhaps, or on the on the internet, planning a few um, texts, getting a few texts out of the library, and then going and picking them up. And a big tip, I should probably a quick way of doing. Like, does, does the library kind of confuse anyone here? It confuses me to death. I can't do it at all. I haven't got the patience all the time. So um, I live in town. So what I do is I hold the book. Hold the book, can't you? You can't hold it and get it delivered if it's in the same library. So if you get it delivered to the Conservatorium of Music, then it gets delivered there. So you just go, so you choose your books, order them like Amazon, and then go and pick them up. And you don't have to go and look at the stacks or save you hours. Yeah. Um, in our Number lines or something. So, like, oh, in line 12 on the intervention, I did this. Or that was best mm, That's nice. Yeah. Good one. As long as you. The thing you have to do there, because you can't. I wouldn't put numbers in your hypertext. So, can you give me a version of that in your appendix? As an appendix. Yeah? That's a very good point and a good idea. Don't forget, as I mark these, you should know what I'll be doing is I'll have a copy of this here. I have your assignment here, and I have your hypertext up on screen. So what you mention in here in terms of the hypertext, I will be able to immediately look at. Even if you go, you know, as you can see, Ian, if you push, don't put Ian, but as you can see, if you press the button twice there, you'll find I will be able to do that. So you can be quite instructive, I suppose. What I'm saying. All right, so are you clear now? Do you feel clear about what we're asking you to do and how, how to kind of how to up the ante is what I'm wanting you to. For those of you who were disappointed in your in your marks last time, um, I just heard from about five or six people that they've never really seen this before. You know, and you have to have this next to your writing, and you can actually mark it mark yourself. That's what I would do. You know, because it's not that long an assignment to read again. So as you're editing, just as you're doing the editing job, making sure your references are fine. We talked about the process of editing. Yeah, as you're editing. Just have this by the side of you and think, have I really? And be critical of be really critical of yourself. You know, have I really shown that I have a well developed understanding of the key concept here? Or have I just kind of you know scraped it, scraped through? And there's nothing wrong with scraping through. If you've got three other assignments to do and you're happy with the satisfactory, nothing wrong with that at all. You know, I have no problem with strategic time management. Fine. But if you want to, if you are wanting to sort of juice up your points, then you are going to have to start um, knowing how to, not just doing, but knowing how to do. So I'm interested in you knowing how to do it. So if anyone here has an issue, like, all right, Ian, it's fair enough you saying I need to have uh, a very thorough understanding of key concepts, but how do I do that? Then, then call upon me and choose. I'm more than happy to talk that through with you. The one thing that shouldn't help you fail is by not knowing how to. That's easy. It's whether you, whether you want to, how much time you put into it is the other thing. All right? Okay, so before I move on, anything, last things you want to ask about this? Yeah. You said, um, why did you do it? Do you mean, like, like, why did you actually change that in the intervention with your actual heart? Like, why did you add the music? Why did you add that? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Every single thing you do has to be justified. What about punctuation? Oh. I want to take out like quotation things, but I took out the quotation marks. So but why would you? But why did you want to? Okay, yeah. Yeah. 
why is it necessary to? And it could be that you're changing the genre of the... Yeah. yeah. So it wouldn't be a poem, or it wouldn't be a speech, or it wouldn't be a, if you didn't do that. Yeah. I have a question for that as well. Like, when you copy and paste it, the paragraphs are indented, but I don't like indents, I don't think it looks nice. Oh, so ask the to ask um, Ben. You did it for me. I don't yeah, know, but she needs to she to justify That's what I have to, because oh. yeah, that's changing it, but... I wouldn't notice that. I think that there are people who would. Yeah. You know, so don't, for God's sake, don't take my, you know, don't take me as a standard. <laughs> the very worrying thought. Um, you know, I, but I wouldn't. That's not something I would, because I kind of understand. Is yeah. it? So you're neating, neating the up, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, plus, also, um, I think so, just don't do that with APA referencing. I had someone last time do a beautiful table. I know why you did it. There was kind of the title, the the, the date, the author, the. You know, and it looks so much neater than referencing would have. But it was still wrong. Because it's not referencing, you know? But I know why people do that kind of thing, but don't do it with referencing. Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay, I think. I can't remember what else I've got. Nothing, apparently. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah. So, specific points to consider. Reading practices, what's going on? And that's, terms, that's you and your reader. Shifts in discourse, why did you do it? Don't do anything without saying why you did it. Especially with hyperlinks. I think, I think it could be very easy with hyperlinks to go, oh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll direct people to YouTube. Why? Why do you want... Imagine, imagine there's a nine-year-old kid sat in front of the computer. I think that's the best way to do it. And you have responsibility for how that child is going to see the novel. Right, so don't expect them to kind of be able to construct any kind of reason by themselves. Right. Um, yeah, and understand the discourse shifts and also the practical shifts, why you did something, which we've, we've begun to um, discuss here. And also the control of the hypertext. Again, what have you done? Don't put... Somebody wanted to um, do a, um, a link into a Disney film, which is perfectly fine, um, but you can't do things for bits of fun in this. You know, so it might end up you end up with a more a more boring hypertext, but at least it's one that you can justify in your writing. All right? Okay. Oh, possible structure. I'll put this up. Well, this is how I this is how I would look at it. This is nothing at all um, revolutionary about this. So introduction. D and I. Well done. Yeah. Then the actual trans transformation itself. Then the result of that. But I think that would be a sensible structure to use. But this will be up on the, the website. Yeah, so we're done. Okay. <coughs> okay, so before we settle in and watch a 10 minute. Um, video clip after which I just need you for two minutes then we can end I just wanted to mention that on the 9th of June I hope I've got to get back in touch with the teacher I've said this to you on the um, internet I've got a high school class coming to the, the, the university from Gold Coast begins with M where? Marino. yeah Marino. Uh, high school uh, what's really what I think is quite cool about the whole thing is you're handing in your assignment on the Monday this is happening on a Wednesday. And they've got to hand their transformations in the following Monday. Hmm? Okay, Tuesday. Is it? Tuesday, you're right. Simon's due on sorry, everyone kinda of went <gasps> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. The assignment's on the Tuesday, this thing's on the Wednesday, they've got to hand their stuff in the following Monday. So they're gonna bring their transformations along. And what would be great is if they, if I can get a cut, there's only kind of gonna be ten of them and a the teacher. I've ordered tea and, tea and scones for the afternoon. <laughs> well, not actually tea. But actually, I, I ordered them and someone said, kids, kids don't eat tea and scones. I thought, well, they've got to have something. So what would you have if you wanted, if you came along? Soft drink? <laughs> Red Bull, probably. <laughs> tea? <laughs> All right. So they're going to come along, they're going to be in... They're going to be in, um, we've got lecture halls sorted. Uh, I'm going to do a 20 minute thing on, on um, textual transformations. And then what I want them to do is to go off into teams 
um, with you guys. And, um, but if there's anyone who feels, uh, I don't have to answer now really, but if there's anyone who wouldn't mind, I would like one or two people to. Um, actually, you know, like um, Sasha and um, Kevin did, uh, and actually demonstrate their transformations. Um, in the lecture hall, I'd be pleased. Yes, well. So it's on a Wednesday. It's on a Wednesday. What time on Wednesday? Afternoon. It's one till four. It's a great way to get a link. I have to say, anyone who's from the Gold Coast who wants a good placement, it's a great way to start making links with high schools and teachers. And you know, that's why we've done it. As well as being good for them. And could you let me know? There's probably people who have already, but uh, let me know if you're interested in that. Okay. Question uploaded by Ashley Lay from Melbourne. To John Marston, you have said that the enemy in the Tomorrow series is unknown, but to many readers of the Tomorrow series, the enemy resembles Asian, if not Chinese, characteristics. Can you confirm tonight the Sorry. true identity of the enemy from the Tomorrow series? <laughs> John Marston. <laughs> It's the one question I've never answered because I don't want people to use the books to justify some kind of racist belief they might hold. So I don't want people saying, yeah, we, could ne- we knew we could never trust those Latvians or those Algerians or those Peruvians or whatever they might... Uh, whatever. Can, can I disagree with you? Because, you because uh, if I'm correct, if I've read the publicity correctly, they're making a film That's true. of this yep. book. Yep. So what... A- well, I'm not going to want to see that film, but uh, you, you're hardly going to be able to make them unknown. They have to assume some sort of ethnic identity for the film. So, so what ethnic identity are they going to assume? In the I've, film? I've heard that Tasmanian. <laughs> producers and what they plan for the movie, but they are going to give the invaders a deafness ethnic identity. So, yeah, that's their choice and I have no input to that. But um, at the same time, yeah, there's always been that fear in Australia of some sort of uh, influx or threat from the north. So that does mean Asia, I guess. And, well, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you dedicated the last book to the... Uh, uh, to the people of Tibet, East Timor and West Papua. Incidentally, all places invaded by Chinese or Indonesians. Yeah, um, that's, the, 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 that's a bit of a hint, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are a few hints like that. But really, I mean, that, in, that dedication could have been to any country that's been overrun by any kind of invading force. It's, um, yeah, the real issue to me in the book is how Australian young people in the 21st century would react given a terrible and pressing challenge or, or danger. There is a belief that modern, pe- modern, modern young people are soft, that they will kind of just go to water when anything dangerous or threatening happens in their lives. And that's not what I've noticed about them, so I wanted to um, bring that up rather than concentrate on... Okay, but I, I'm just going to press you a little bit more on this because I discovered a little corner of the academic world that's fascinated uh, by this question, and they raise the issue of whether or not using uh, a racial type as an invader in Australia actually can create xenophobia, the very thing uh, you're worried about exactly. And they, they, they pick up on your use of words to describe the invaders as locusts and plagues, the description of them as cunning, fierce, well organised, etc., etc. And they claim that this is drawn from uh, overtly racist vocabulary, vocabulary from the Federation era invasion texts. Now, I appreciate that's an academic work, but people are looking at your sort of books in this light. What do you say to that? I normally get interviewed on book shows by very gentle interviewers who kind of <laughs> put this sort of pressure on. But uh, you, you've been interviewing politicians, obviously, and uh, I'm under under the hammer now. Um, <laughs> It's hard, there's hardly been any country in history that's gone more than a generation without being invaded. Australia's gone 200 years now without being invaded, although we came pretty close in 1942. So it's not unreasonable for us to look around and consider that there could be some future danger to us, as every country in the world should look around and consider their local environment. 
now we are in that kind of Asian Pacific region, so uh, I think it's not unreasonable to look around like that. And of course, whenever someone invades you, you want to characterize them in terms that will be um, comfortable for you to justify your response to them. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see them as a pernicious and you know, ugly and uh, destructive force. So I don't think any of that is unexpected or could be um, considered unreasonable when you're writing about a war and uh, an army that's kind of overrunning your country. Yeah, I mean, I have to well, add, uh, my, my children have uh, listened to these books on long car rides across the country and enjoyed them enormously, as have I. But, I mean, it does raise these interesting questions. And, and I think the film will raise even more interesting questions because you're going to see, physically, uh, Asians <coughs> invading Australia. It's going to be quite... You're a Asian. Well, <laughs> I think you've more or less confirmed it. No, no, I said that the producers were a slightly different culture. Sorry, Well, I remember age 16 reading a book by a character called Russell Bratton, The Year of the Angry Rabbit, uh, which raised exactly these issues uh, for me as a youngster. I don't think John can escape from the politics of this. Uh, you know, normally you would say, well, OK, he's an author and he's, he's writing a book and he's creating an imaginary situation to illustrate a point. But, you know, deep within Australian history, of course, we have, uh, we've, we've had this very, very strong racist undercurrent. And in terms of Asia, and remember that the perception that Asia has of these issues, I can use that term very generally, was, of course, of Western imperialism and colonialism uh, defined by race uh, coming into, uh, and in many cases, of course, uh, controlling those countries. And the Chinese feel this very, very strongly, that for two centuries, you know, they were treated uh, as, as an inferior people. And uh, there's a lot of resentment about these sorts of issues. So I think it is, if Australia is to live with Asia, which we have to because it's our geographical lo location, bringing race into the question uh, of, you know, what may or may not be a, a question of... Um, uh, the invasion of Australia is quite dangerous and evokes the very images in Asia that we don't want to have in Australia. So I don't think, I don't think John can escape from the politics of it, even though writing a book I know requires imagination, etc. John, it's not about race, race. it's about no. national identity, which is the well, 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 I don't think, think it is actually. Nationalism, <laughs> as, as a current, uh, is a very dangerous force in our modern world. And I think if you look at China, the one thing we don't want to happen in China is rave of nationalism. Uh, we saw rave of nationalism feed, uh, you know, Japanese imperialism in the 1930s. So, you know, this concept of nationalism okay. is a very dangerous one. Let's John respond to that. We have someone in the audience who wants to hear As a writer, one of the things that I know and that I've found as writing these books is that the great advantage of setting your book in a war theatre is that everything will be more intense. So characters who fall in love in wartime will be much more interesting than characters who fall in love in any other context. Characters who have an argument with each other, friends who fall out in a war, in the theatre of war, that's far more powerful than intense. So as a novelist, that's kind of my first priority, my first interest. Let, let's hear from uh, audience. Hi, I've got a question for John. Um, your book, The Rabbits, is obviously about England's invasion of Australia. Why is it okay for that to be so obvious that these rabbits, you know, because they're English, yet it's not okay for you to make any other race in the world no, 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 no. identifiable? <laughs> not, that's not okay, that's not that word. You use that word obviously, but I, that's a word that I kind of uh, always raises hackles on my with me. It's, uh, it's not obvious at all. The, the rabbits is a metaphor for any uh, situation where an invading force. It uh, invades and conquers and colonises another country. So it's nothing to do with Britain in particular, although it's um, pretty, it looks like an Australian context in which this is happening. But no, I don't think the, the, this, this characterises uh, British people any more than tomorrow when the war began might characterise uh, Chinese or Asian or any other. So did you want to sit on this side? Yeah, I was just, I was quite shocked by just <laughs> reaction. It seemed like something from, you know, cultural wars of 20 years ago. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your country. And, yeah. and what are we going to do now? Have a manifesto and, and double check what authors are writing. Let's be so politically correct. Let's not identify or possibly um, look at any race to invade Australia. Let's make them you know, aliens. You know, is that going to offend someone? I mean, let's, le let's allow artists and authors the freedom to write in the tomorrow theory. <laughs> and others the freedom to do so. Absolutely. But 
is that this uh, book series has had an extraordinary impact on so many young people, including my 14-year-old stepdaughter who hasn't read as much as, as long as I've known. But, but don't you think we have a responsibility when we use the term national identity to put content into it? Uh, Australia's national identity around issues like a democratic system of government, uh, a system of freedoms that, that underpin our society, a belief that we can live together with different religions and different cultures. You know, to me, that's a much stronger concept. And I think it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt there because having read the books, I would say that uh, they're much more subtle than the other ones you're depicting. Well, I did oh. totally refer to page 203, John. <laughs> <laughs> the invaders eat Peking duck. <laughs> What's with the cameraman? <laughs> oh, where's an Asian? Oh, there's an Asian. <laughs> anyway, um, what's good about that, I thought, was um, if you go back, guys, if you go back and, and read that, listen to that again when it's not the first time, there's about seven, I counted seven ideas for, um, for, for ideologies and discourses that are within the novel that you could just nick, just nick it. Someone else is do it, you know. This isn't about kind of, well, it is about being original, not plagiarising, but nick it, it's fine. Uh, there's lots of stuff in there, specifically around national identity, which I think is starting to come up in our conversations, but something we didn't specifically look at. Um, all of which is very interesting. Okay, so I'm not going to see you like this again, so thank you very much um, for being a wonderful lecture crew. And, um, but this, this time next week we'll be here. I'll be here, so please come in and, and bring the work and start doing it now. Just get on with it now. Start working with it now. So well, it's fresh. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. I'll be in. No, I'll be in here. Oh, next week is. To do, you know, you have. I think in tutorial time next week is when you burn your CD. So next week, tutorials are happening, but the lecture isn't. Simply because I, you need to start working, I can't give you anything else. Yeah. Well, I don't know. We'll have to ask Ben that today. <laughs> Blake? Yeah, like, it's easy to take any class and then you can put on your stage. No, no, no. Oh. Hey, thanks, guys. Oh, guys. Sorry, please take one of these and go. Yeah, and that's a really good point, wasn't it? You don't necessarily, but if she is referencing it. Yeah, you don't necessarily. Don't forget, I'll have the hypertext up as well. Yeah. Yeah. So in the defence, if you're talking about...